Well, I'm just going to do like I did last week and just read the text to you and start off that way, see what happens after that. Uh, we are now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, I think it took us like eight weeks to do chapter 1. I, I think it was eight weeks. We got chapter 2. We're going to start. It's going to take us another eight weeks. Here we go. Paul says uh, in verse chapter 1, verse chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Now, chapter 1 we, did, we spent a good little bit of time on this. Like I said, it was eight weeks there. P Paul has described the Christian gospel message for us in f several different ways, but I just want to highlight three of them. He says in uh, verse 17, chapter 1, not with words of human wisdom. Verse 21, the foolishness of what was preached. The gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness. That's what he says. Verse, 20, uh, verse 23 says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. What we preach, this gospel message, may be foolish, um, may uh, not be wise by human standards, but we don't use human standards. We don't use those kind of words. The gospel, the cross of, is God's power to, to call God's people to himself and to save them, to grant them the faith to believe. Now, Paul has not finished explaining this yet, discussing the gospel preaching, if you will. Uh, in fact, in chapter 2, he's going to use himself as the illustration uh, of how you're supposed to preach the gospel. He uses his own self to say what happened. Verse 1, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence, or superior wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. He says, I proclaim to you the testimony about God, which is basically the same thing as saying the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the cross of Christ, the cross that Jesus died on to save people from their sins. It's the Greek word, um, well, we get the English word martyr from it, marturion. Martyr, we, which we think of as means someone who dies for their faith, a martyr, or who dies for a cause. But the word just means uh, simply proof, a witness to the proof, evidence, a witness who gives verbal evidence of something that's affirmed to be true. That's what martyr means. That's what witness means. That's what testimony means. You testify to what you've seen yourself or what you've heard or what you've experienced. If you go to the court to have to testify in court that's what that is you're giving a witness you're giving a statement of proof your testimony is evidence and it's admitted as evidence and a witness can only report what he knows a witness can only report what he's objectively uh, has the facts for and what he personally knows to be true you can't speculate you can't guess perry mason will eat you if you try to do that it has to be the truth same word as in 1 Corinthians 1, 6. Our testimony, we already looked at this, our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. The same concept is in Jesus was talking to his disciples in Mark 13. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. Witnesses to governors and kings, that's the word. You will testify. You will give a testimony to kings and to governors. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And the testimony that you're going to give is the gospel. You'll be persecuted, but you'll be handed over to governors and to kings to tell the gospel to witness to them. That's the testimony of God. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul proclaimed the testimony about God to the Corinthians. The same gospel message that we spent all this time looking at in chapter 1. The gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross. The cross where Jesus died to save sinners from their sins. That's the message. Now he's given us uh, his example of how that philosophy of preaching works. 
of how to proclaim it, of how that works out. And he says, it was not with eloquence, which literally means superior speech, not prominent speech. The speech that I had when I was talking to you was not a preeminent speech. It was not over the, high, over the top. It was not high, a high status or important because it was so superior to anything else anyone says. My speech was not superior. My speech was not sublime or excellent. My language was not used to impress the erudite Corinthians, the brainy people. I didn't come out with brainy things to make the smart people think I was smart. I wasn't here to impress anybody. I didn't use any kind of eloquent speech to impress anyone. When I'm preaching the gospel, Paul says, it's just the plain words of the message of the gospel. It's not really anything impressive. He also did not come with wisdom, he says. Now, that doesn't mean Paul was not wise or that Paul was not smart. We all know that he was very smart, super intelligent person, super wise guy. And when you read his letters, you obviously know that he was wise and that he was smart. But when you add these two uh, expressions together, not with eloquence or not with wisdom, all it means is that Paul didn't show off his verbal and mental skills when he's preaching the gospel. The words that came from his lips and how he formulated sentences um, were not to show off his exceptional thinking skills. I mean, we're Christians and preachers. I mean, you know them, I know them. I've heard them, you've heard them. It's like you can't say a word, they can't say a word to you unless they have thought out every cool word they can think to say it so that you know how smart they are by the words they use. Now, some people really are smart, and that's the way they think all the time. I don't know anybody like that in my own life. All right? I, I'm not that way, see? But that's not what Paul did. Paul is not fishing for fine-sounding words when he teaches the gospel. That's what the Greek philosophers did. That's what the Greek orators did. Is that even a word, orators? Orators. That's not what they did. They did it that way in excess. It was all a show-off. It was all a show-off. So when you come with the gospel, you don't come to show off how smart you are. You just come with the gospel. That's what Paul's saying. He's not showing off how smart he is by his wordsmith craft. That's not his vibe. That's not his style at all. In fact, that should never be any Christian preacher's style. Now, if you really are smart and you use words like that all the time, there are some people that just read lots of books so they know all the words. Most of us are not that way. And that's not the way Paul was. It was just the message. Just the message. That was it. So much so that Paul even exaggerates how much it's just the message. He says, I resolved to know nothing among you. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I resolved. I made up my mind. I made a judgment call. I decided right then and there when I crossed the city limits of Corinth, I'm not going to know anything for these people except Christ and him crucified. Now, when you say that, it makes it sound like Paul is very narrow and he's very non-intellectual. I'm only going to know this one thing and this one thing only and nothing else. Now, that goes back to when I told you a few weeks ago, um, or how many times I've ever told you this, there's always some guy at the seminary, always some guy in your Bible, in your Bible class, in your theology class, that goes, why have we got to study all this style of theology? Just give me Jesus. And right here's where they get it from. I don't want to know anything except Christ crucified. Well, at least there you have to say, just give me the Jesus that was crucified. I need to know that Jesus. Now, this is it. And we know Paul is not against learning, and we know Paul is not against knowledge. In fact, he knew a lot of things. Paul did not check his brain at the city limits when he crossed into Corinth. He didn't come there not knowing anything. He quoted Greek poets in his sermons. He, uh, to, to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens, he said, uh, he, he, he's preaching to him. He says, for in him, in 1728, in him we live and move and have our being. 
That's a quote from a Greek poet. And then he says, as some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul's quoting Greek poets to Greeks. So he's not saying he doesn't know anything. In fact, he says the same thing to Titus, talking about Cretans. The people from Crete, they got their own poets that say Cretans are all liars and dumb. Paul knows what he's talking about. He knows a lot of things. Plus, think about this. Uh, in Galatians chapter 1, I'm not going to go into the whole spiel of it, but Jesus, after he got, I mean, Paul, after he got saved in Damascus, went out to the Arabian desert with Jesus for three years. He was taught personally by Jesus Christ, by the risen Jesus Christ. That's where he learned his information about gospel doctrine, gospel theology, the gospel message. It was Jesus teaching Paul the best seminary, seminary education anyone could ever have. The best ever. Jesus is your teacher every day for three years in Arabia. So Paul was deeply committed to understanding and proclaiming the entire content of Christ, Christian truth, all the doctrines. In fact, just read his letters. Read just the stuff that Paul wrote. He's teaching Christian doctrine all the time. He wrote Romans. Look at what he says when he met the Ephesian elders and uh, Acts chapter 20 in Miletus and he's talking to those elders and he says you remember uh, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God when I was in Ephesus for a year and a half I taught you everything I was teaching you everything I could think of every doctrine there was to teach every part about God's word the whole counsel of God so Paul knew more than just the crucifixion of Christ when he says I resolve not to know anything I resolve to know nothing except Jesus him crucified doesn't mean that's all he knew he knew a lot and he taught a lot but as I said a few weeks ago back when we were in chapter 1 Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins how many times did I say it in like one sermon. Some of you made fun of me because I said it so many times. Not because it wasn't true and because you didn't like what I said. You just liked the way I said it because I was saying it a hundred times. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins. I didn't come to preach Christ uh, as a good teacher. I didn't come to preach Christ as a great example or Christ as a perfect man even. Or any other good thing about Jesus Christ that would benefit mankind, that would bless people. I didn't come to teach you how Jesus will bless your life. I didn't come to teach you how five ways to have a good day by trusting Jesus. I didn't come here to do all that stuff. In fact, that would be the same thing as human philosophy. The stuff I'm complaining about, I would be doing that if I, if I did anything else except Christ crucified. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. That's it. If you don't hear anything ever the rest of your life, hear that and believe that. Jesus died on the cross to take away your sin so you will not be condemned for it, that you will trust him and you won't be judged. He was judged for you. Believe that. That's what Paul means. Christ died on the cross for our sins Christ was crucified Christ was hung on a tree hung on a cross to die there that's the focus of the message that is the message the death of Christ on the cross is the foundation of all Christian teaching I have nothing else to say that's basically what Paul's saying not that I have don't have a lot to say I have a lot of things to say but don't get sidetracked from the main thing. The main thing is, if I'm going to come to your town and preach to you the gospel, it's going to be the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was crucified to take away sins. That's it. Believe that more than anything. I said it already back in chapter 1. read it a while ago. We preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. I resolve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I hope you know, I hope all of you know, I like theology, I love doctrine. There are minutiae of doctrines and, and uh, 
categories of doctrine that we all must know, and I hope you know them and understand all of them, all of the Christian content there is out there. It's important that we must believe the right things. We have to believe the truth about the revelation of God, the revelation of God in nature, the revelation of God as he has revealed it in the Scripture. That is the special revelation of God. Without that, we won't know anything else about God. Without that, we wouldn't even know that Christ died on the cross for our sins. It's important that we understand Scripture, the doctrine of Scripture, very much. We have to have that before we learn any other doctrine. We have to believe what the Bible teaches about God, about the person of God, about the nature of God, about the character of God, about the holiness of God, about the Trinity, all the attributes of God. Well, that'll take us a month of Sundays to go through all that. We have to believe what the Bible teaches about God as the Creator, the Creator God, not evolution. Not Darwinism. God created the world, and God created the creation. Stuff we have to learn, stuff we must know. Those are very important doctrines that you and I must believe. And we also have to understand God's greatest creation. You know what that is? Man. God made man. God created man. That's his ultimate creation. The ultimate creation is that God made man. And God made man to have dominion over everything else. That's a vital, important doctrine. If you don't have that doctrine, you're going to be messed up on all kinds of things. Major doctrine. Oh, here's a big one. This is a major doctrine. Uh, it's important that you know this, and it's so vital that you know this one. God made man, gave him responsibility to manage the creation, but something went wrong. Sin entered the world and corrupted everything. It's, very, it's vital that you know that, not that you just know it head knowledge, but that you completely understand the doctrine of sin. Everything is corrupt because of sin. You're corrupt and I'm corrupt. We're all corrupt. It's messed up. That's a vital doctrine. In fact, without that doctrine, the doctrine of Christ crucified doesn't mean anything. Because that doctrine means that because we've sinned, God is going to judge us. We are condemned because we're of sin. We're condemned because we sin. We, we can, we're condemned and we're going to be judged by our sin. Now, the cross of Christ, preaching Christ crucified, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, actually does mean something because of a whole other doctrine that Paul said, I resolved to know nothing except Christ crucified. Well, I have to know the doctrine of sin. I have to know all these other doctrines as well. I have to believe also in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus ascended to the right, to the right hand of the Father. That's what gives the gospel message, the cross that he died on, credibility. You can say, yeah, a lot of criminals died on crosses in the first century. This one rose from the dead. This man was perfect. This man was righteous. This man died on the cross to take away sin, and he proved it when he rose from the dead. That's a doctrine that you must believe. That's a doctrine that you have to believe, vital, critical. We also have to have a correct understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's where Paul goes next. I'll get there today, and we'll look at that some more next time too, maybe the next two or three times. The work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate our dead hearts and give us life, spiritual life. We're dead spiritually. The Holy Spirit wakes us up and makes us alive spiritually. That's a critical doctrine. You have to believe that. You have to believe the correct understanding of that. We also have to understand what the Bible teaches about the, the church, God's people, the body of Christ. When Christ saves people, he puts them in his church, in his church, his body, and he puts them in local churches. That's vitally important. So we're not talking about I resolved to do nothing and nothing else matters except Christ crucified. There's a lot of things we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus is going to return. He's coming again, and he's coming again to judge the world. All these things are critical to our faith, all of these doctrines. And I just hit the highlights. I haven't even done it. How long has it taken me, five minutes? You could take 
You can spend 105 minutes on each little part of each one of those. It's very important to believe all the doctrine of the Christian, of the content of the Christian message. But Jesus Christ and him crucified is the main truth. That's the truth. I don't have anything else to say to you today except that Jesus Christ was crucified for your sins. And I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face and can't breathe anymore and I'm wheezing out my last breath to you. Believe that Jesus died on the cross to take away your sins. Charles Spurgeon wrote one of his sermons, or he said one of his sermons, this is the one thing needful for us to know. All our reading and studies will be in vain if we are ignorant of Christ and his atoning blood. If Paul the preacher determined to know nothing but this, we may be sure it is above all things important. This is the message. Jesus Christ died, was crucified on the cross to take away sin. That's the message. That's what Paul means. The crucifixion is the message. No eloquent speech. <clears throat> no fancy wisdom. None of that stuff can do anything to enhance that message. Now, if you really are smart and you use big words, cool. But you don't make up big words to make the message look cool. You can't do anything to make the message look cool or sound cool or be more believable or make it more understandable. You got nothing to give. I got nothing to give. I've got nothing. And on the contrary to having something to give, Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. A lot of stuff there. Weakness means having no strength, without strength, like body ailments or diseases, some kind of incapacity or some kind of limitation, which... I'm going to go ahead and say it. I think Paul had some kind of a, a issue with his well-being. He had a health issue or something going on with it that was problematic to him. Something, something was going wrong on with Paul that made him say, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. Now, you just don't say things like that unless you're either making it up or there was something wrong with you. And I know Paul wasn't making it up, so something was wrong with him. He was limited. Something limited his mobility. Something limited his ability to function properly. Something like that, nobody knows. There are scholars that propose different things that Paul had problems with. But we just don't know. And I'll give you more of that in a minute. But Paul says he came in weakness and he came in fear. Now this is the Greek word phobos. We get phobia from it. It means to be afraid. It means a fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the future, fear of the authorities, fear of having to debate those smarty britches Athenian types again because he just left Athens. He came, came from Athens to Corinth. Get tired of arguing with snobs. Um, terror, fear, terror that seizes you when danger appears to be looming over your head. That's what Paul was feeling. He's not a made up, he didn't make up a word just to say, hey, I, I was afraid. And he means I was afraid. I was, I was fearful when I came to Corinth. The dread or the panic or the, or the desire to run away, something makes you want to run when you're afraid. Paul felt that way. In fact, he um, emphasizes that emotion by adding a term to the text. It says, I came to you with weakness and fear, and with much trembling. Well, this word trembling is a Greek word, tremos. We get the word trembling from it. Just translate it to an English word, I guess. Transliterate to an English word. It's the word, uh, we get our word tremor, like an earthquake tremor. It means quivering, shaking. Quivering in fear. Quaking in fear. Not just that you're afraid, you're so afraid, you're shaking. That's what Paul says. 
He had some serious anxiety and fear issues when he came to Corinth. I, I, I don't really want to believe this about Paul. This is what he said. When I came to you, I had fear, weakness, and much trembling. And it starts to make sense to me uh, because to the contrary of a know-it-all super smart guy with all the polish and bells and whistles who's got all the good, the good erudite uh, wisdom words to say and cleverness of speech and all the things that you think. He says he comes into town just the opposite. I was scared when I came to Corinth. Now, Paul had preached the gospel in many places before he got to Corinth. He, up to this point, he had been uh, all of what's now modern-day Turkey, uh, already been across to the Macedonian, the Philippi, and Thessalonica, and Berea, and he'd already been to Athens, been to Jerusalem, Damascus, lots of places he's already been, and he's already been preaching the gospel there, and he was very bold. He was bold so much that he suffered a lot of persecution and hardships because of his boldness. In Derby, just a few years earlier, in Galatia, uh, the, the, one, of the church, one of the churches in the Galatian churches, it says in Acts 14, 19, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. I don't know what it's like to be stoned, but somewhere that's got to get inside your head. I don't know what kind of scars that left on his body. Anybody been hit in the head with a rock? You got a knot on your head that won't go away or a scar on your forehead that, where the rock dug in there and it just stays there or maybe a permanent headache or maybe other, some kind of health problems that persisted after you got stoned to death. Acts, Acts, Acts 16, he's in Philippi, cast a demon out of a slave girl, uh, Verse 22 through 24, Acts 16, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet with the, in the stocks. The inner cell is where it's the coldest part. At least that's how if you want to torture me, just put me in a, in a jail that's cold and don't give me any covers. After a while, what? Paul has other unpleasant episodes like this. Uh, all of his missionary journeys. He had to leave town in the middle of the night. Thessalonica, Thessalonica, just the next town he was in, had to get out of town in the middle of the night. They're coming to get him there too. In Berea, he has to get out of town. They're coming to get him there too. Athens, he runs into these smarty britches and argue with him. He tells us other things, First, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. I have been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and day in the open sea, probably cold water too. I have been constantly on the move. Got to, got to leave town all the time. Got to move around everywhere I go. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, <coughs> in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. Exposed to death again and again. I mean, seriously. Seriously, Paul. I just sometimes wonder... Uh, when I read verses like verse 3 where he says, uh, when I came to you, I was, came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, I just wonder if somehow all of these experiences of persecution, of being exposed to death all the time, again and again and again and again, day after day, having to leave out, leave out of town, that it just doesn't take a toll on your psyche. Now, no one wants to think that about Paul. Paul's a super giant, a super giant apostle. He's the best Christian that ever lived. And here he's saying he was afraid. Maybe he just got him unnerved from time to time. And this is one of those times. He said he was afraid. 
much trembling. And we said this back when we first started Corinthians, just in the introduction to the book of Corinthians, on well, the very first sermon. Uh, I said, this is why I believe God came and spoke to him in a vision to encourage him in uh, chapter 18 at Vax. 9 through 11, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half pre teaching them the word of God. Well, Paul had to give, uh, God had to give Paul a vision to keep him from being so afraid. Now, there's a point to all this. Because when you're that afraid, what makes you bold, what makes you, what makes you just go, you know, I have a message that if I preach this message, God will save people, but I'm afraid. But I also believe Paul had a, uh, some physical malady, I said a while ago. People think he had eye problems or vision problems or something. I'm not sure what it was. Paul describes some of this, I think, it was probably some kind of physical issue. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Then you're already scared, for who knows what reason. Probably just don't want to get hit in the head with a rock again. I probably don't want to get beat again. I don't want to get hit with a rod. I don't want to get hit with a whip. I'm just tired of all this persecution. I'm scared, and I don't feel good. I think that's what's going on with Paul. When I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with eloquent speech or superior wisdom I didn't come with any of that stuff. All I wanted to know, all I really cared to know, all I really cared to teach you was Jesus Christ and him crucified because I was scared out of my mind and I didn't feel very good. I know I'm belaboring the point. I'm probably going too far about it, to be honest with you. In fact, I wrote that in my notes because I thought I was going too far about it. But Paul wanted them to know that he's preaching the gospel of Jesus' crucifixion for sin no matter what the negative consequences are to his life. He's preaching to them the gospel of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ no matter how apprehensive his feelings were. It's his call to ministry. God called him to that. He knew it. He couldn't stop. Now, I don't want to belabor this either, and I don't want to make a doctrine out of it for you and me here uh, because I don't think all of us are called in the same way Paul was called to go take the gospel to uh, pagans who are going to stone you when you get there. Some of you maybe, but I hope it's some of you. Then I can brag about you. So-and-so got killed over there in Timbuktu preaching the gospel. But we're not all called to tell the good news to the lost the same way Paul did. But we are called to tell the good news to the lost. Make disciples of all nations. Go preach the gospel to every creature. We're supposed to spread the gospel everywhere. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell it myself, but I'm going to pick on you too. Uh, we have been fearful to tell the gospel to, to a non-believer for way much less fear than Paul had. Whatever Paul was anxious about, uh, mine was not, my, I don't even know, things I was worried about and scared about to tell someone the good news is, I feel guilty saying it. I want someone to like me. That's different than not wanting someone to hit me in the head with a rock or beat me with a stick. That ought not be. We ought to be bold to share the gospel with people no matter what our fear is, no matter what our apprehension is, whether we feel good or not. Because it's the message that saves, not you and not me. It's not us. Paul writes uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It doesn't matter what our weakness is. It doesn't matter what our terrors are, what our fears are. We need to make sure that we tell this message to the lost. 
Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross to die so that sinners could be saved from their sins if they will believe him. That's basically it. And just saying that message, just speaking that message, just telling that good news highlights God's all-surpassing power and not us. If you say that message and someone gets saved, you can, it proves it wasn't you. You got problems. God doesn't. His message doesn't. That's what Paul says here, verse 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. It's God's power. He's characterizing his preaching. I came, I was afraid, I was afraid, and I had weaknesses. I was trembling, I was afraid. I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be doing something else. But I came with this message that had nothing to do with wise and persuasive words. Same thing he said in verse 1. I didn't come with superior speech or wisdom. All I had was this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the word of the cross. The message stays the same. The message is the same. Don't change the message. Don't mess with the message. And he says the message, it's the Greek word logos. It just means something I said. Something that I thought that was expressed in words. That's the word the word message means. Then he says, my preaching. It's a different word, but it's not too different in meaning. It just means to proclaim or to announce, but it has a, a twofold meaning, I guess you'd say. One uh, dictionary said, uh, actually the biggest lexicon there is out there, a twofold sense, signifying both the result or proclamation, what is proclaimed, and the actual proclaiming it. I came with both the act of preaching, the act of proclaiming, the act of telling, and the message, the content that I told. My message was not with wise and persuasive words. He adds it to another word here too. He's used the word persuasive. The power to get something done or to buy, the power to get someone else to do something. The power to get someone else to think something. I didn't even come with that kind of persuasive words. I didn't come with any kind of uh, pressure, putting pressure on you to get you to believe something that you didn't want to believe or to get you to do something that you didn't want to do. But he is persuasive. Uh, King Agrippa writes in, uh, or says in Acts 26, 28, Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul's doing all he can to persuade Agrippa to believe in Jesus Christ. He does this all the time, Acts 19 Verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But a better translation of this verse, or a better translation of this phrase, might be, not with persuasive words of wisdom. Not that I'm not trying to persuade you, not that I'm not trying to convince you, I'm just not trying to do, convince you using clever and fine-sounding words and some cool methodology to entice you, to get you uh, every head bowed, every eye closed, hand raised, come down the aisle, pray the prayer. Uh, you're saved. I'm not into that. I don't have any methods of persuasion to bring to you that's, whiz, that's human wisdom. Pope, uh, Paul did not use a host of genius illustrations and stories about people he met the other day and so on. Now, there's nothing wrong with a good illustration. In fact, some people don't even remember the sermon, but they'll remember the illustration, which is sad if you ask me. That's when you're using wise and persuasive words to get people to believe something because they didn't even remember the words that you said about the gospel. They remembered an illustration. That's what Paul means. I already made fun of it. I'm going to do it again. Paul was not into pithy invitation altar calls with soothing music in the background while he spoke in a soft, devotional, God loves you and God really gets, and whatever you're struggling with today, whatever's going on, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know what that is? That's using human emotion. That's using human wisdom to get people to believe the gospel. And the gospel is Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins. That's it. If you don't believe that, you're lost. 
If you believe that, you're saved. I can't do anything else to get you to believe that. I don't have any wise and persuasive words to make you believe that. I think the same thing like Peter when he went to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. I didn't think of it until after I already printed my notes. But I want to say, he's over there preaching. Hey, God, show me I can't judge anybody. I, I, I'm not going to be a respecter of persons. God's not a respecter of persons. He starts preaching the gospel. He doesn't even get to the invitation. He doesn't even finish the message. The whole group of people in Peter's house get saved. Why? The message, the message, the the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ has power to save. Which is what Paul's saying here. He's, I'm just coming to preach the gospel of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to take away the sins of man. I'm just coming to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ who died on the cross to take away the sins of man. That's all I've got to say. And that was a demonstration of the Spirit's power. The power of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated through the gospel message just proclaimed. Just preach the gospel message. The Spirit will do the work of bringing people to Jesus Christ. The Spirit will do the work to save. This is the only word in the whole New Testament where you use this word demonstration. That means proof. This is the proof that the Holy Spirit was there. You preached the message. You didn't, you didn't embellish it with anything. You didn't make it sound good. You weren't spiffy or, clean, or, or, or clever or none of those things. You just preached the message and, got, and people got saved. That proves that the Spirit did it. That demonstrates His work. Not showy display not signs, not jumping around, not rolling around on the ground, not laughing, not hocus pocus. Now, sometimes in the New Testament, they did use, there were miraculous gifts that, that were accompanied by the preaching of the gospel in the early church. And we're going to study those things when we get to chapter 12 a few weeks from now. But that's not the norm. That wasn't the norm, and that's not the norm now. I think what Paul means is when he says, my uh, preaching was a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He means the exact same thing that Jesus meant when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus came to him and said, uh, we know you're a teacher from God. And, and Jesus says, uh, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of the water and of the Spirit. You have to be born again. You have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be uh, surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, and you, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. This is how that works. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, comes down upon a dead man. And someone's just... Yapping the gospel message at that dead man. The dead man can't hear, can't see, can't move, can't respond, can't do anything. He's dead. You have to be born of the Spirit. He's not even born. He's dead. And you're trying to preach the gospel to him. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and he comes like a hurricane. The wind. You don't know anything about the wind. You don't know how to stop it. You don't know how to make it go faster. You don't know how to make it slow down. You, don't, you, hear it, you see the effects of it and you hear the sound, but you have no idea where, it, where, it is, where it's coming from or where it's going to. So is everyone born of the Spirit. The Spirit comes down and energizes the gospel message of the cross and regenerates the dead man and makes him alive. That's what that means. It's what the Spirit does. It's His power. He raises the dead. He gives spiritual life to spiritually dead people. When people hear the gospel of Christ crucified, just hearing the gospel of the message of Christ crucified, things that the persuasive words and clever words cannot do, the Spirit does. They hear the message of the, of the Christ crucified and they believe it. They get saved and that proves the power of the Holy Spirit working. 
just that someone got saved because they believed this message that you taught them about Jesus dying on the cross, that's the Holy Spirit. Certainly not you. It's certainly not me. It wasn't Paul. I mean, some of you, you make fun of me, and it's okay. I say, how are you doing, Mike? I'm a Sunday morning. I'm a nervous wreck Sunday morning. I know it's not me. It's the power of God to save people when they hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's it. Paul says, our gospel, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, our gospel came to you not with simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. And it has a practical reason for it too. Very practical, very practical. It says in verse 5, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Same thing, same thing Paul says a lot of times. Back to chapter 1, I came to preach the gospel. God do not call me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I spent a good little time on this. Anytime you embellish the gospel message with something clever, you take away the power of God to save. You empty it of its power. It's empty. Just say the words, say the message, say the cross, say the crucifixion, say what Jesus did. That's the power of God. Lest the cross be emptied of its power for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, what is it? What's the gospel message? It's the power of God. It has the power of to save because that gospel message is energized by the Holy Spirit and he saves. He regenerates. He makes alive. He awakens dead people. I love this one too and I've read this one to you many times a few weeks ago I think. The Lord, Acts 16 and Paul's in Philippi and he goes out to some women at the river who are gathered for some prayer and he starts teaching them the gospel. Starts talking to them. And the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. Lydia, sweet lady, I like Lydia. I'm sure I would have been Lydia's friend. But she would have been dead, uh, spiritually dead forever. Had Paul not showed up and just started telling this message. Hey, ladies, did you know that Jesus Christ, God's son, died on the cross to save us from our sins? And the Lord opened her heart. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to make her alive, to awaken her, to give her life. And she believed. She became a believer, strong believer. And it goes back to like, if, if you're one of those people who believe and your, your belief was based on the wisdom of some man's teaching, some clever way or manipulation gimmick or trick to get you to believe, then you will never have any real assurance that it was God that did it. I remember went went to a, right here in Myrtle Beach, big name speaker, came to preach a, a, a crusade type thing. He didn't mention the cross one time, yet the whole place was full of people to come down and get saved. The whole I the whole... The whole crowd of people coming forward to get saved. And I said, like, how do these people get saved? They didn't even hear the message that saves. And I'm wondering how many of those people really did get saved. I really do wonder that. I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to put anybody down or make anybody feel bad. I just wonder. Because there's always going to be a better reason. If it's clever words, there's always going to be a better word a better reason for you to believe or a better reason for you to uh, trust Christ so you can have a good day or so uh, you can be blessed or so you can not be so depressed or so you can um, not be so lonely or whatever it is. It's always a better reason. But there will never be a better gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross. If that's what you believe, then you know it was God. I don't have anything. All I have is the cross of Christ. That's God. C.S. 
Do you know, if you know Jesus died on the cross was for you and you believed it when you used to believe it was or still is maybe nonsense, and yet you believe it? You believe something that formerly you thought was nonsense? I'll guarantee you there's no way you were convinced of that except by the power of the Holy Spirit, period. God's power to bring you to faith. Your faith will rest on God's power, not on men's wisdom. So I'm as long as I can breathe, as long as I can preach, as long as I'm up here standing, uh, I might sound dumb with my accent and all that stuff, I don't know, but I'm going to just say the same thing every time. Jesus Christ died to save you from your sins. Believe him. I'm going to teach you all the other doctrines too. I promise you I will. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins. Believe him. That's all I got. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we are glad that you have given us your word, that you have uh, revealed to us this message of Jesus' death for us, that by him dying in our place, we could have eternal life. We're glad for that message. Lord, I pray that you will uh, apply that message to each heart in this room today. I pray, God, that you will uh, work grace in each one of us here today, that that'll be our message that we proclaim, that we speak, that we teach, that we tell our lost families, our lost neighbors, our lost coworkers, our lost friends. Lord, so we can see your power. We want to see your power to save and not our fancy tricks, clever notions. You show your power to save through this gospel and use our lips to bring this gospel to the ears of lost people. Father, I do... Uh, ask you to do this for us in Jesus' name, for his sake, for his glory. Amen.